I'd like to welcome you to our service that's been recorded for Sunday 22 November. We're so glad that you can be with us today. It's certainly warming up here in uh, Melbourne and uh, we're all in, enjoying that freedom to uh, come and go as, as uh, we wish and thankful for God for all of his manifold blessings, uh, both heavenly and uh, as we live here on this earth. Uh, there's a lot going on in uh, the life of our church. We have some special gatherings and meetings coming up that you are uh, aware of. As, uh, there'll be something on this afternoon and a church picnic, Lord willing, next Sunday afternoon. And uh, be in prayer. We're hoping to be able to be uh, back at our usual facility in early December. And we'll keep you informed of uh, all of those details. I trust that the uh, series in Genesis has been a challenge and a, a blessing to you this year. We are into our final few messages on the life of uh, Joseph. And uh, then uh, next year, we've been thinking and uh, considering uh, some uh, return to the New Testament, uh, returning to the Gospel of Matthew. And so I appreciate prayer as uh, I uh, consider a series of messages for uh, 2021. Should the Lord tarry? Should the Lord tarry? And um, uh, I'd like you now to uh, join with me in a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you today for our <clears throat> service and our gathering. We thank you, Lord, that we come to you in the wonderful name, precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we come to you through his merits on the cross. We thank you that we have an advocate at the Father's right hand. We thank you that we have an intercessor, whoever lives to make intercession, to pray for us, his blood-bought children. And so we come to you this morning with tremendous thanksgiving. We thank you for the progress made on the coronavirus front in Melbourne, though our hearts are heavy for our countrymen in, at, in uh, South Australia who are enduring some very severe restrictions. Pray that those will be kept to a minimum. Pray for churches there that are, that are certainly shut over the next couple of weeks at least. And we, we commit our brothers and sisters to you. Pray that you would encourage them and, uh, and certainly bless them uh, over these coming days. Father, we thank you that, um, uh, Lord, uh, you have been so good and kind to us this year. We thank you for your faithfulness and your blessing upon us. We commit our missionaries to you, those whom we support, evangelists, missionaries in other countries, pastors. I know that a number of them have had some severe health issues this year and some uh, undergoing further surgery. Uh, Lord, we, we commit each one to you. Some uh, very low, some struggling after multiple surgeries. And so our hearts are heavy and burdened for them. And so we commit them into your care. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, you would bless those in our church with families, young children who have missed a lot of school this year. Pray that they would have a good end to school this year and perhaps that they might need to do some catch up over the holidays and things. Pray for those in our church that have grandchildren they haven't seen a lot of this year, that, that they could have reunions with them, if not already. Pray for those that, um, uh, Lord, are uh, struggling for work or uh, other, uh, other things going on in their life. Uh, pray that they would look to you, the great God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Lord, we ask that today, uh, that as we gather and open your word again, what a joy it is to be in a church where God's word is treasured, where the word of God is preached each week. And so, Lord, speak to us through your servant Joseph today. Paul tells us in the book of Romans that, Romans that the things written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So grant us a great measure of hope today as we see the way Joseph looked to you and the way that you greatly rewarded him and blessed him for his faithfulness. And may this encourage us to serve you and to point others to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray in his wonderful and precious name. Amen. In the lives of those who prove his faithfulness. 
chains of sin and death and rise triumphant from the grave. By faith the church was called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner Our scripture reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 49, verse 22 to verse number 26. Joseph is a fruitful bow, fruitful bow by well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him and hated him. But his bow remained in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your father who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of your father 
have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. blessing to open God's word this morning again in the book of Genesis and the 49th chapter continuing with the second message on the inheritance of Israel the inheritance of Israel 
when we looked at Genesis chapter 49, verse last week. Uh, we saw Jacob speaking to his sons, giving them their future inheritances, and they would all have to listen. They would have to listen. Jacob had been distant from many of them because of favoritism and because of their own uh, deception and disobedience with the conspiracy of his sons against his beloved son Joseph as it had been brought to light all the family secrets were over they were all exposed just as God will bring in his own good time every hidden thing into the light of his judgment and evaluation uh, Jacob now would speak to his sons as both father and as both patriarch, as Jacob and as Israel. Uh, someone has divided up the, the, the inheritance in Genesis 49 as coming down to three sections. One, the men who were disqualified. We, we've looked at some of those. The men who were distinguished. And then the man that is Joseph, who was different. And so these words of Jacob in granting an inheritance to his children, or even withholding some, uh, were not just his own human wishes, I believe he was expressing the mind of Jehovah, uh, the mind of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is a family judgment of sorts, a kind of poetry, the longest one in Genesis. And of course, the chapter focuses on uh, J Judah, who we looked at last week, and now this morning, Joseph. Uh, someone has called this the last of the great sayings of destiny, the blessings, curses, judgments, and promises which punctuate the book of Genesis. It is the last of these great sayings the promises that jacob gives to his sons are deeply messianic shiloh is mentioned in verse 10 salvation or yeshua verse 18 the mighty one the shepherd the stone in verse 24 and the almighty in verse 25 speaking richly of christ who would come from the tribe of judah and we've also seen that the the actions of Jacob's sons caught up with them, uh, for some especially. Last week we had a little bit of a roll call. I remember having a roll call when I was in school, particularly high school. They would make sure that you know you actually showed up to school, and sometimes you would have a spot spot checks, spot roll calls during the day or the the end of the day to make sure you stayed all day at school. Well, let's let, let's do a roll call of Jacob's sons. He had 12 by four different wives. There was the six sons of Leah, Sim, uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Zebulun, and Issachar. There were the two sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. There were the two sons to Bilhar, the maid of Rachel, Dan and Naphtali. And then there was Gad and Asher, sons to Zilpah, the maid to Leah. And so last week we looked at the inheritances to the to the first four Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, and that inheritance to Judah was very precious, because Shiloh would come from him, the one to whom it belonged, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to him would all people one day obey. And I wondered, do you know Shiloh, the one to whom the promise belongs? If you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's look uh, at the other sons of Jacob today, and we'll be looking at some uh, more expeditiously than others. There is uh, Zebulun and, and Issachar. In verse 13, Jacob predicted that Zebulun would dwell by the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall adjoin Sidon. Zebulun, another son of Leah. He would become wealthy by trade and commerce, through the tri though the tribe never had a coastal portion. Uh, they would trade with the Phoenicians along the coast, 
and they carried uh, merchandise from the coast to Galilee and Damascus. It was Zebulun who did come to fight against Sisera in Judges 5. There is no spiritual blessing or rebuke. Simply they would prosper materially. Now let's look at Issachar. We'll discuss Zebulun and Issachar together. Issachar in verse 14 is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. It's a picture of a, of a burdened donkey in slavery. Now, Issachar was the last son to Leah. And like Zebulun, his brother, he would, he would materially prosper. Later, they would, they would trade themselves as hired servants so they could live in a more prosperous place. As one writer said, the descendants of Issachar traded their liberty for the humiliating comforts of slavery. These brothers Zebulun and Issachar remind me of God's people who settle for second best. They will do all they can on this earth to gain materially, all the while putting God in the back seat. Don't be like that. Don't be like that. Often distracted by earthly pursuits. I hope that as restrictions lift, we trust, we trust. And as a vaccine becomes available next year, we pray. I have to preface those remarks. I don't want us to get ahead of ourselves. That all of us would renew ourselves to the Lord and to the local church. That we would be even more committed to coming along. But when we have our regular gatherings, we have our prayer meetings and other ministries, that we would that, that, that we would make up for lost time, as it were, and be doubly committed. And be committed to your local church. If if you're from Open Door, be, be committed to Open Door. If you're listening from somewhere else, well, I hope you listen to your own pastor this morning. But be committed to your local church. Don't be a drifter. Don't be tossed about by everyone you might come across on the internet. Dig deep in your local assembly and be committed and be faithful. Give, contribute, serve, minister to each other in love. Well, we come to Dan in verse 16, born to Bilhah, the maid of Rachel. It says in verse 16, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heel so that its rider shall fall backwards. Jacob here predicts future judges from Dan. Many believe that that verse 17 is in fact a prophecy about Samson who would come, the mighty judge who would afflict the Philistines. But then unfortunately Samson brought much affliction upon himself and Israel through his own disobedience. Samson is a great example of a man gifted but still carnal, wonderfully strengthened by God and yet really no self-control, really never handed his life over to the Lord fully. But then notice in verse 18, Jacob, he almost pauses during his speech and he says in verse 18, I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. His cry of hope is in the Lord, not how well his sons and descendants are going to go. Can they hold it together? Can they be faithful to God? What are my grandkids going to be like in the next generation and the next generation? How long will it be till Shiloh comes? I mean, these are all questions beyond his reach and understanding. His hope is in God, as our hope should be in the Lord. I've waited for your salvation, O Lord, Jacob says. Uh, Jacob's entire life had been about waiting. He died at 147 without really inheriting the promises. In fact, he had to leave the promised land. He had to leave the promised land. Whether waiting seven years for his wife, Rachel, or 13 years again at least to see his son, Joseph, probably many more years, or the full promises of the covenant God with his grandfather, Abraham. 
In Hebrews 11, verse 13, it said, These, these Old Testament saints, these all died in faith. They died with empty hands, so to speak. Not filled with God's promises, but they certainly had, had faith in him. I hope it didn't confuse you by what I just said. I meant to say that they died without having received all the, the promises in their hands, so to speak. But they had faith that God would fulfill his word. The writer to the Hebrews says that they have seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That Jacob must die in Egypt. In Egypt. The psalm writer says in Psalm 62 verse 5, My soul wait patiently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. And you know what? When our faith is ultimately in God, we can never really be disappointed. If our faith is in God alone, then we can never be finally disappointed or devastatingly disappointed. Our hope always has a basis. Our faith always has someone to look to who will never let us down. Well, we come to Gad, Asher, and Naphtali in rapid succession. Look at 18, 19 to 21. Gad, a troop, shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. Bread from Asher shall bear it, and he shall yield royal dainties. Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words, words of promise, hope, and progress. They would have their place and their part in God's promises one day, but they're dealt with in, in rapid succession, a little bit like all those genealogies in the Old Testament where you just get the name of the man or woman. Really, nothing else there, a link in God's chain of redemptive history. But before we get to Joseph, these obscure tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali are mentioned in Matthew 4 concerning Christ who had come. And uh, we know that in Bible times, Zebulun and Naphtali were part of an area called the Galilee of the Gentiles because of all the Gentiles there. And in Matthew 4, verse 13, it says, And leaving Nazareth, Jesus came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. Those two tribes that Jacob hardly says anything about. Why did he come in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali? Well, Matthew says in verse 14, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, and this is what Isaiah said, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, Beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Do you know who Jesus would come to? All of the tribes of Israel, not just Judah, or Je not just Judah, but all of them, including Zebulun and Naphtali. The well-known and the less well-known Christ would come for all of his people. He wouldn't forget any of them any of the tribes and of course we know that christ also came for gentile sinners like you and i as well well let's deal with with benjamin now in verse 27 before i suppose we you know get to joseph the main focus benjamin in verse 27 is a ravenous wolf in the morning he shall devour the prey and at night he shall divide the spoil there is there is just one verse on benjamin it's surprising don't you think that Joseph and Benjamin, Jacob's favorite sons, why only one verse? You would expect he might have more to say about his youngest son. Benjamin was the son of his right hand. Benjamin means the son of his right hand, but very little is said about him. He is likened to a ravenous wolf. Well, what does history tell us about the tribe of Benjamin? We know that men of Benjamin helped defeat Sisera in Judges 5. Saul, the first king of Israel, was from the tribe of Benjamin. So there's some distinction there. During his career, Saul pursued David. Like the ravenous wolf that Jacob talks about, Benjamin will be, verse 27. 
and he massacred everybody in the priestly city of Nob in 1 Samuel 22. Other Benjamites known for their ferocity were Abner in 2 Samuel 2, Sheba in chapter 20, and Shimei in 2 Samuel 16. Saul of Tarsus from Benjamin persecuted the church bitterly, and so there's a bit of a mean streak, a zealous streak in the tribe of Benjamin. But when the nation divided after Solomon, when there was that division between north and south, the tribe of Benjamin remained faithful to David and stayed with Judah. So Benjamin and Judah formed the southern kingdom. There was a spiritual tenacity to the tribe of Benjamin. So now we come to Joseph, and it is the focus of chapter 49 as well, of course, of Judah that we've seen previously. And this was our scripture reading, and, and um, I'm you know, halfway through the sermon, so don't worry too much. I'm looking forward to hopefully preaching to you face to face sooner rather than later. But in verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow by a well. His branches run over the wall, this, this tree that just grows with branches and foliage. Even though, verse 23, the archers bitterly grieved him, they shot at him, and they hated him. I mean, these are talking about his brothers. His brothers, not the Canaanites, not the Egyptians. His brothers, these were the archers. His brothers, and they, you know, the brothers are hearing this. I, I hope they, they got it, what Jacob was, was saying through this poem. But, he says in verse 24, but his bow remained in strength. How does Joseph persevere? For that matter, how do we persevere during troubles, whether persecution or other things? It says his bow remained in strength and, and the arms of his hands were made strong. By who? By the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. God strengthened him. Let me tell you the let me tell you the ingredient in Joseph's life that made the difference. God. God. God made the difference. God made the difference. Why does Joseph persevere? Because he looked to God. And he looked to God for his strength. And he went to the everlasting wells of God's strength. And God can strengthen us too. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is true for you and I as we live for God. He, he, we can do all things he calls us to. All things he calls us to. To do for him. If we remain in his strength. God was Joseph's strength in these verses. God is called the mighty God of Jacob. The shepherd, the stone of Israel. The God of your father, the almighty. If we were just, when we're feeling spiritually weak. If we would just think about the names of God. Hey, I serve the mighty God of Jacob. God is my shepherd. Though shepherds were an abomination to Egypt, the world. He is my stone, my great rock. He is the almighty. And then from verse 25 and 26, we see the incredible blessing of God heaped upon Joseph, upon him in his own lifetime and in future generations. The God of your father, verse 25, will help you and by the Almighty who will bless you. You have the blessings of heaven above and, the, and, and of the deep down to the ocean, up in the sky. This is, this is the image. There'd be no limit, no limit to God's blessing. There would be material blessings, the blessing of, of abundant children. The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors, uh, the promises to Abraham, Isaac would be continued in abundance to Joseph and his seed. Israel would grow as a nation. In fact, it would have an eternal blessing because it would go to the utmost bound, verse 26, the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. Hills that just never run out. They never end. God's eternal blessings. They'll be on the head of Joseph, verse 26, and, and notice how verse 26 ends, and on the crown of the head, the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. The one who got carried away into Egypt, nowhere to be seen or heard from again, they think. God will put a crown on him. 
makes him second under Pharaoh. That speaks also of the exaltation of Christ. Forsaken by all, forsaken by all at Calvary, left by his disciples, I should say. And yet God crowned him with great triumph in his resurrection and then ascension. And so those years of Joseph's suffering were returned with multiplied blessings over many more generations. Let me tell you how God's economy works. God's economy works this way. Temporal, temporal suffering for him equals eternal glory. God rewards temporary, temporary suffering with eternal glory glory now that's not a fair deal that is grace friends that's not like for like that is god god god's abundant grace pouring in i mean that's why paul said in romans 8 verse 18 i consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us Paul said it's not even worth comparing. It's not even worth comparing. Don't even put the time into it. He, he, he later says in 2 Corinthians 4.17, For our light affliction, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Our, our three score years and ten or more or less is, is, is in view of eternity, a light affliction. What are our years on earth compared to a million years in glory, a billion years in glory, for that matter? A light affliction. In Ephesians 2 verse 7, Paul tells us that in the ages to come, as eternity rolls into eternity, God is going to show us the exceeding riches of his grace toward us in Jesus Christ. God is going to spend an eternity showing us how much he loves us. What a good father he is. That is an incredible truth. Peter tells us that we are to rejoice to the extent that we partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, we may also be glad with exceeding joy. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3. There's a lot to look forward to, friends. So let's be patient like Joseph was patient. The blessings that Jacob pronounces on Joseph remind us of the covenant promises about the stars and sand to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This would continue through the line because God is faithful. Now, last week, we, we, we read from verse 28 of Genesis 49. I'm going to read it to you again. It says, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. Jacob, under God's leading, gets this exactly right. He gets it exactly right. He rises to the occasion. What Jacob predicted happened. It was a promise and it was prophecy, an inheritance and also a prediction. And what hasn't happened yet will happen one day. So there's some unfinished business in Jacob's prophecy, all the nations haven't yet obeyed Christ. That will come one day. But all will eventually come to pass because the reputation of the promiser is at stake. God himself. Now we are fast coming to an end in our series in Genesis. Uh, Genesis 49 ends with the, the, uh, the death of Jacob and uh, we're going to continue that along with chapter 50 next week so there's a couple more messages left and hopefully we can have those messages back together in person but I want us in these closing moments to think about the uh, wonderful inheritance that God has for us uh, you know, maybe your parents didn't leave you much of an inheritance. Maybe they just couldn't. Maybe they just couldn't. Maybe 
they they gave you their inheritance while they were still alive. I don't, I don't know. We all we all have people have different stories. Many interesting ones, I might add too. But there is an inheritance that God has for us in Christ, in Christ, that is wonderfully gracious. And the only way that we will persevere in this life, faithfully serve him, despite the setbacks, the distractions, even our own internal discouragements, which can often be the hardest, not as what is going on out there, but what's happening inside, that can be the, the severest trial and test, is to look to our God the mighty God, the everlasting God, the stone, the rock. When we think about who he is and what he's promised and what he's done for us, our, our hands and our arms can be strengthened with the arms of God, just like Joseph's was. Joseph was exceptional because he had an exceptional God who he looked to when his brothers didn't. That's the difference. And I trust that we will, like Joseph, keep looking to the Lord, allow him to strengthen us and to refine us and allow, allow our brothers and sisters in Christ to help strengthen us in the battle. You know, one way God strengthens us is by giving us a Christian family to stand with us and to, to be with us shoulder to shoulder in life. Don't abandon that. Don't withdraw from God's people. Let's draw closer to each other in the days and weeks and months ahead and stand strong together in our everlasting God. Amen. benediction this morning comes from psalm 18 from verse 1 to verse 2 i will love you o lord my strength the lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my god my strength in whom i will trust my shield and the horn of my salvation my stronghold 